Welcome to the HerbWorks Podcast featuring Roger Drummer, the formulator at HerbWorks.com. An educator in the field of nutrition and Chinese herbalism, Roger has a unique ability to keep things simple by taking all the guesswork out of complicated health issues. HerbWorks is committed to helping you improve your health and enhance your life through herbs and common sense. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another HerbWorks podcast. I'm Laura Shakti. And Roger Drummer. So what are we talking about? Well, the main topic today is so many people are confused, really, about stress and why Western medicine says that 90% of all illness is stress-related. Does Western medicine really say that? 90% they do. of it's illness? Been, it's been a common statement for the last decade at least. No kidding. 90% of all illness is stress-related. So you're saying there's something good about stress as well as something bad and ugly? Well, there is good stress. You know, lately the big topic in some of the health um, news is is hormesis. hormesis. Hormesis means a small amount of something that your body adapts to that's a good stress. Now, originally they were talking about small amounts of chemicals you were exposed to, <laughs> but they've kind of adapted that term to, to describe things like exercise. Exercise wears you out in the beginning and then you adapt to it and you get stronger. So the more often you do that, your body gets used to responding to small things. Same way with now they know that if you dip yourself in ice cold water, like you go to some of these spas, they have hot tubs and then mm -hmm. they always have the cold one that nobody gets oh, into. Oh, don't get me started on that because I am a Northern European girl. We know about cold water days. But nobody gets into them. But the reality is if you expose yourself to that, your body, it's really good for your thyroid, by the way, your body adapts to that and it's able to regulate itself more. And it actually just feeds into your body's whole process of self-regulation. So cold pools are another example of how a stressor, this case really cold water, has a beneficial effect to your health. So is it true then that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? I don't know if that's true in all cases. But, <laughs> but it relates to stress somehow. It, it relates to stress. Small right. amounts of certain things, like one glass of wine, might be beneficial for your heart. Mm -hmm. But four of them won't be. Right. Same with the beer or some kind of... Yeah. Weren't you telling me the other day about some study? Uh, people living to 100 all had a similar thing that they did? Well, the funny thing about almost every culture that has people that live to be 100 years or more, almost all of those cultures have one thing in common. And that is that they sat down at a certain time in the evening when their day was over and had mm -hmm. one drink. And generally, they don't drink any more than that. But it's a, it's a ritual for them. It's the end of their work day. It's the mm -hmm. end of their socializing. They have one drink. It could be something local. Because a, a lot of societies around the world, small towns, make their own local liqueurs. And mm -hmm. they make their own little things with alcohol. And they have one drink, and that's the end of their day. Hmm. Which, well, that could be a lot about a lot of things, not just the alcohol. That could be no. about the socialization, the ritual. It could be a lot of things. That's but a good stressor. Yeah, it helps with stress. So tell me, what is, should we st start with the good news? What's the good news about stress? Or do you want to start with the well, bad? Well, the good news is what we just covered, actually, <laughs> is that there are ways of stressing your physical body that helps it respond and get stronger mm -hmm. and it helps it regulate itself. The bad thing about stress is the fact that our body is still locked into the same old stress response that it's had for millions of years. And so, you know, from, from the beginning of time when we had a stress response, which means we were in danger, something was going to eat us, right? And so <laughs> we responded a certain way. Well, our body still does that. And the problem today is that we have that same reaction sitting at our desk when we're supposed to be running for our life or fighting for our life and using up all that energy that gets flooded into our body from a stress response. But instead, we're sitting at the desk, you know, angry about an email or somebody mm -hmm. in the office. Oh, sure. Like little that. things that people ruminate over and then it becomes a really psychologically right. so stressful situation. That's kind of the start of really bad chronic stress because we have these stressors all day long. So instead of like we were out in the jungle and we got frightened and something happened and then all of a sudden you recover from it immediately because the danger is over. 
We never give our body the signal that the danger is over when we're at work, and so we're in it all day long. All right, so you are basically talking about the difference between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and how we respond to that with stress, correct? Right, and so just to explain that a little bit, sympathetic is the part of your nervous system that kicks into gear in survival mode. And so parasympathetic basically just means that's when you're relaxed. That's when you're actually present and you're paying attention to stuff. So one of them happens where everything is run at a heightened level when you're under stress and you're not paying attention. The other one's when you're more conscious and your body's running at a relaxed state. And in most people, the system is supposed to work equally. You're supposed to have the ability to be relaxed, you know, go into present mode and and then shuttle over into the high octane stress mode. And it's all supposed to balance out. So your body's always in a kind of an equilibrium. But the problem with modern living is that we're almost always stuck into sympathetic nervous system and we don't give a lot of time um, to parasympathetic nervous system. So what happens from a mechanical point of view, when your sympathetic nervous system is constantly in gear, when you're constantly in this fight or flight mode because of your life? Well, this this will take a little explaining, okay. but, but when you hear it, you pretty much get a picture as to why um, it's so bad for your health in so many ways, and especially for heart disease. Because, you know, we all know heart disease is the number one killer. And they like to blame that on cholesterol, right? Because, But that's just a simplistic way of looking at it. But what really happens when you have a stress response is that first thing that happens is, you know, you get a, if you really wanted to be technical, you're, the glands in your brain send a signal to the gland, your adrenals and they flood your body with hormones. Mm-hmm. So then your breathing skyrockets. You start breathing fast. Sure, we're all right. familiar with that. Your digestion shuts off because who needs digestion when you're running away from something? Well, you, right. you divert that energy and blood that would have gone to converting your meal into energy into putting energy into your hands, your feet to run. Right, right. So you don't want to, who cares about digesting food? You might die. <laughs> right. So and, and your body, again, doesn't know that you're not being chased now. You're just sitting at your desk or you're in traffic and it's ticking you off. Right. And then all these your sex hormones go down immediately. Right. So this is one of the reasons why we have so many people with problems with their sex hormones. You know, as they get older, their their levels of stress actually drive down the production of stress hormone. And then their stress hormones are elevated, causing an incredible amount of inflammation. Well, actually, studies are showing that many millennials and even uh, the generation below are having issues with sex drive, um, which was not prevalent before in people under 30. Well, part of that is just what I described Uh with the stress, but also the eating habits of Americans have gotten so bad in the last 30 to 40 years that we now have a new generation of kids that have all grown up with really poor diets. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, at least, you know, I'm, I'm 60 years old, at least. And, um, <laughs> Senior discount. <laughs> and uh, when I grew up, even they didn't really have that much junk food around. Right. We had yeah. junk food at a picnic. Or we it was had something, something unusual. It was special. something unusual, but we always had a garden. We always prepared food. Every one of our meals was at home. So even though it wasn't what I would consider health food today. It was clean food. It was pretty good quality. And that's what we grew up on. But today, people are just growing up on fast food and they don't know any difference. And so they got this, they're not really having a a good launching pad as far as overall health in life. Right. And just so our listeners know, we still subscribe to that lifestyle. Only I grow the garden and you do the cooking. Yeah, I, yeah. I cook we still cook almost everything all my home. meals. Yeah. yeah, I prefer it. I like quality food. Well, you so. also cook really well. Yeah. So anyway, so when your sex hormones go down and you get flooded with all these other hormones, your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up, your sympathetic nervous system is just kicked into full gear, right? So now to deal with the edit, extra energy that you need, your heart force goes up. In other words, your heart rate, your heart wants to beat faster and harder Mm -hmm. to push more blood around so you have access to more stuff. 
so they shoot back into your heart with more force, which forces it to beat harder and shoot it back out faster. Mm. And then the arteries leading away open up a little bit for the extra blood flow to shoot it out to your body, right? So all these things are happening when you're having the stress response. And so what happens then is that your body now has this extra amount of blood forcing its way through your system. Mm -hmm. And that creates a huge problem. People because, are already getting stressed just listening to this. I mean, I can well, feel I can feel myself getting into stress mode well, just listening to this. This is what where happens? the big problem comes from because <laughs> now uh, all that blood flow is causing pressure and stress on every junction of every vein and artery and little blood vessel throughout your whole body. Everywhere it turns and has a junction gets more stress now because it's coming through much faster than it ever was supposed to come. Oh, that's an interesting way to look to at come, it. It's like traffic. Right? Well, they say it's kind of like forcing a, trying to force a fire hose from a fire truck through a garden hose. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. much more volume and pressure. That's an interesting right? analogy. So at every junction, and there's, you know, there's millions and millions of them throughout your body where these little veins and things break off and go into different directions, mm -hmm. right? Well... At every one of those junctures, it puts a tremendous amount of stress on it and causes little micro tears and injury. Hmm. And every one of those injuries now create inflammation, which now you have a response to, right? And because you're stressed out and your body has pumped out some extra adrenaline and other stress hormones, your um, platelets in your blood start to clot together. They start to to um, form into clotting much mm. easier, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, people, most people that eat a poor diet anyway have blood that's too vicious, it's too thick anyway. So now you've increased its ability to get thicker and you're putting more pressure on everything. Hmm. And then every time you have a little injury and one of these little tears, you tend to fo um, create these little foam cells in your blood, which mm -hmm. have a lot of fat in them, which tend to collect there. And then if you have floating cholesterol around and you have um, too much sugar around and you have all this other stuff that's just floating through your bloodstream, it all tends to collect there. Reminds right. me of a traffic jam in Los Angeles is what and, it sounds you know, like. <laughs> and this is basically this is basically how you end up with plaque because you have all these foamy cells, you have this extra um, platelets mm -hmm. clumping up, you yeah. have the extra LDL cholesterol, you have you right. know, triglycerides that are released during the stress response for energy that don't get broken. Everything's just kind of a mess. And you've got a bottleneck. It's basically clogging up the works, right? And you've right. got an injury there and it all collects. So this mm -hmm. is going on all over your system. Okay. And then after that happens for a while and you start developing plaque, now on top of all these other things, when all this extra pressure and blood flow is needed, you've got you know, arteries and veins that aren't completely open. They're actually slightly closed because mm -hmm. of the plaque. And this is kind of where high blood pressure starts too. High blood pressure is usually you don't have enough, you know, you don't have enough space for your fluid to go through. So then when you add on again, like most people have too thick of blood because mm -hmm. they eat so poorly, then you add the stress to it. Now you're collecting all this fat and stuff mm -hmm. in certain areas where it's injured. And now you're building up plaque, and then you end up with, you know, high blood pressure from the inflammation. Now, all this is still going on, and the blood's going back to your heart, right, after a period of time. So now that blood vessel that's constricting to force the blood faster back to your heart, well, it might be halfway plugged up by now because of all the plaque you build up from years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's really forceful, and it tends to injure the tissue of your heart. So, so all we, these things are kind of a snowball effect down the road. It doesn't happen right away. It starts to accumulate when you're young, but by the time you're, depending on your diet, 30s, 40s, all this stuff is just accumulating in your body. So the bad part of stress is actually the response, I guess I would say, the stress response, that your body perceives a threat and it wants to respond to this threat, which we need for life preservation, right? right? So the, the stress response itself is not bad. The problem is that it stays for too long. It happens too often. Is that what I'm understanding? It happens too often. It stays too long. 
but also just the very fact that you're having a stress response means that your body floods itself with a lot of extra energy because it thinks you're going to be running away or fighting to the death. So if you're someone who eats poorly, already has a lot of fat and sugar circulating through their system, then you add to the to that, the stored energy that now floods mm-hmm. your system, right? And during that stress response, you're not going to secrete much insulin because it thinks that you don't want to clear that energy out. It wants it there. So now you get all this stuff circulating through your body that your body can't utilize or handle at all. Mm-hmm. And it's creating an excessive amount of inflammation and you already have an inflammatory state. Right. So, so your start- body can only handle this for so long and things just start to break down. Right. So it's a natural process, the stress response. But the problem is that with modern day life, we are kind of in m- many of us in a constant day, a constant day to day place of reacting to our lives with this stressful response, whether it's through traffic or colleagues at work or financial stresses, um, which is why adaptogenic herbs help regulate that process, as well as things like yoga and other lifestyle things you do. All those things, the, the adaptogenic herbs, the yoga, the you know, the diet and lifestyle, all these Mm -hmm. things tend to feed your parasympathetic nervous system and allow you to go into a more of a balance. There's a big thing in in the health field the last 10 years on heart rate variability. And a lot of people are confused by that. But what it basically means is the ability of your body to um, turn on parasympathetic nervous system and have a balance between your responses and your resting state. In mm-hmm. other words, you with great when you have great heart rate variability, that you tend to be more in parasympathetic nervous system. So you're actually regulating yourself, and you're having clearer thought, and you're more present, and everything snowballs from that perspective. In other words, you create a snowballing effect of feeling better and having better experiences. And when you do that, then you have less of the all-out stress response experiences. So is that related to what we would say in yoga when you have a positive mind, a negative mind, and a neutral mind? At least I myself find when I take something like Tianchi, when I take adaptogenic herbs, my neutral mind is stronger. So that, in other words, I may perceive the stress right? Whatever that is. Right. And the positive mind might say, oh, it'll go away. Don't worry about it. You know, walk on the other side of the street. Not a big deal. Um, The negative mind would say, put on your armor, get your sword, go fight that beast. Um, So for me, I find that the, the neutral mind is more of a balance between the parasympathetic parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Yes, and that's what you want to you want to balance. We had one of our clients who actually took and did uh took our Tianchi and did his own test with heart rate variability. Really? What happened? And it increased heart rate variability by our, between 10 and 15%. It was huge. Had a great effect and this was right away after taking it. Really all that means, you know, to me is that you became more present, you became more aware of your surroundings and you weren't just reacting to life. That's what I mean by the neutral mind. This is the thing about stress. You don't want to have a life where you spend most of your time just reacting Reacting. to it. Mm -hmm. You want to be present and you want to make decisions and you don't want to just react. So how do adaptogenic herbs help with that? Because they regulate the very glands that are involved in the stress response. Which glands? Which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal. And so by regulating your actual response and making the adrenals healthier, the adrenals then can um, complete the feedback loop and shut off the stress response. So you have stress responses for shorter periods of time. Mm. And over a long period of time, you have less intense stress responses. Doesn't mean that you don't have them, but because you're more relaxed, your nervous system isn't keyed up, you don't have such a great... Um, propensity to have extreme stress responses. In other words, you become used to seeing the bigger picture and being more relaxed. Someone who's completely stressed out, doesn't sleep, 
can have a huge response, stress response to a minor incident at work because of the position they were in when they had it. Yeah, you see that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so So that's what what adaptogens do. They change your overall health of your nervous system so that you're having different responses. Right. So what you're saying is that it's a natural process to have a stress response because as human beings, we're programmed to survive. And the stress response is part of that, to survive, to fight the lion or run away from the lion. Right. But when you take adaptogenic herbs, when you modify your diet, when you participate in lifestyle choices such as yoga and other things that reduce your stress level, then your nervous system is going to respond differently in that you're not necessarily not having a stress response it's just not happening for as long or as intensely? It's not as severe and it doesn't happen as often because you're more relaxed and you have a different way of looking at life. And this is where the lifestyle and the diet come in that are so important. Because diet, if if you're waiting for uh, ill health or waiting until you're completely stressed out to eat better, it's never going to happen. You have to have a plan And this is why I've said before, and I I always will tell people this, that if you can regulate your blood sugar and have a diet that does not abnormally raise your blood sugar, then you can avoid most chronic disease. And why is that? Because if you regulate your blood sugar, that means you're eating a healthy diet. That also means that your body's not overburdened with fats and sugars all the time when you do become stressed out and add to it by the stored fat and sugar okay. you're going to dump out during a stress response. So you're healthier and then you won't crave things when, you, when you're when you totally stressed out because you're already on a plan. You're already eating better. And so you don't fall into all these other pitfalls that just accelerate the damage from your constant stress. All right. So you talked a lot about the mechanics of what happens when you're in stress response. And you've said that adaptogenic herbs um, regulate how the hormones or how the, is that cortisol? What what? It regulates all the hormones of your stress response. It regulates every gland in your body. So So it'll have an influence on every level of hormone. It doesn't mean you take them and your hormones will go up. Uh, It might go up in response to your diet, to the herbs, but they only go up to a normal state where the gland isn't worn out. You know what I mean? So it's not going to push you into a high hormone state of anything. But because they're regulating and they make your glands healthier, it's not unusual for your glands to go back to a normal production of hormones, whatever that is for your body. So... The adaptogenic herbs that you work with in your formulas, one of the benefits, I guess you could say, in in relation to what we're talking about, stress, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is that you're still going to have stress responses, but they'll happen less often. And it sounds like because the adaptogenic herbs are bringing you back to homeostasis, back to a recovery position, that you're going to maybe not be as stressed out. As, you won't and, be as stressed out for as long, and, and you recover from it. And the recovery is the big thing. It's yes. not so so bad to have a stress response. Everybody's going to have them. But you want to move into the recovery phase, and this is the phase that people miss when they're worn out and they've had chronic stress. They don't ever go into recovery, and then their body never actually repairs itself. Right. So I have this really visual picture about the fire hose going into the garden hose as far as the stress response. What does the recovery from stress response look like, especially if you are taking adaptogenic herbal formulas? How is that helping? What does that look like? Well, it's just a natural response in your body to release other hormones that signal the stressor is over. And then when that happens you go into a recovery phase. Your heart slows back down to its normal thing. Your breathing changes. Your digestion turns back on. Everything's relaxed. And then because you're, let's just say, for example, you're taking an adaptogenic herb formula like my inner peace. Mm -hmm. Because I put herbs in it that are good for your adrenals, in that phase, it builds your adrenals energy back up to get it to its normal level. So your body can recover quicker from a stressor. 
And that's really kind of the key to it. Everything returns back mm-hmm. to its normal set point, and then you move on with your day. So it may return sooner, is what you're saying, that right. you may relax your heart sooner, that your blood vessels are going to open back up to their normal size, that the stress hormones, cortisol, are going to be regulated better. And this is this is really important, especially when you move beyond heart disease to looking at something like diabetes. You know, type 2 diabetes is epidemic in this country. And and if you just look at some of the things we talked about earlier, when you have a stress response, what happens? You flood your body with fats, stored fats, released energy and glucose. Your muscles are getting primed to fight or flight, but you're sitting in your chair at work, right? Well, <laughs> if you're diabetic, you already have a flood of of fats and sugars you haven't burned up in your bloodstream, and now mm. you're flooding it with more, mm. and you can't deal with it because you're insulin resistant, meaning your cells aren't listening to insulin, and so that you had too much floating around anyway, and then now you're adding to it with your stress. So now you're flooded with it, and your body's not even getting close to the amount of insulin it needs to change things. And you're kind of sitting there with, you know, type 2 diabetes. This is why they tell you that you can start on the path to type 2 diabetes just by missing one night of sleep. What? Yeah, because if you miss a night of sleep, you automatically wake up in a stressed out state. Your body's already in a stress response. And then the average person, what do they do? They stumble out of the kitchen, have some coffee with sugar in it, and then they have some, maybe a donut and some cream cheese or butter, and now they're flooded with sugar and fat from their diet, and they were already from their stress response. Mm -mm. And so now they're primed, and they're going to be sitting in their car getting more stressed out on the way to work, and so now they're primed for diabetes. Hmm. And so if you already have it, then it's just made it worse. So the bad part about stress is that it can contribute to diseases, as you have said, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, also digestion and lack of immunity. Yeah, it it affects your, you know, you can end up making your diabetes worse or starting mm-hmm. the process to get diabetes. Uh, it messes with your digestive energy. This is a huge thing that people don't really recognize with with stress is that to have a stress response means that you're in danger. Your body does not want to digest food. So it's going to shut off at least, the very least, 50% of your digestive energy just shuts off. How interesting. So if you're eating and you're stressed out, which most people do because they'll eat while they're standing at work. They're not even sitting down. They'll be eating a sandwich. They'll be eating their Coke and their fries while they're standing there. They're stressed out. Or they'll be driving down the road eating. Right. right? So they're engaged in something that engages their sympathetic nervous system, and their bodies just shut off. It's not going to digest their food. It sounds like eating while you're driving could be one of the worst possible things you could do. It's the worst possible thing you could do. So now you're basically not digesting your food wholly, you're creating inflammatory chemicals in your food because it's not digested properly. It's not going to go through your digestive system the right way, and you're not going to absorb all the nutrients from it. So you're not only probably eating a poor diet anyway because you're stressed all the time, but the little bit of nutrition in it that might be in your food, you're not going to really absorb and utilize it. Hmm. So you have to do something to... Uh, be conscious when you're actually eating. And, you know, I was reading a report once. It was really a fascinating story on this very topic where this teacher taught a guy a breathing technique to go from sympathetic nervous system to parasympathetic, right? And all it really required was breathing in one nostril for the count of six, holding it for the count of six, and then blowing it out the other nostril for the count of six. It's what we would call alternative nostril breathing pranayama in yoga. And so, and just repeating that five or six times, right? So he wanted the person to do that. And he also told the person, do not eat while you're driving, because the guy ate every day driving. And besides, the guy in this study also was someone who loved McDonald's cheeseburgers, he loved McDonald's cheeseburgers, fries, and Coke, and he told the teacher that he was never going to stop eating his favorite food. 
So he put him on this technique, told him mm-hmm. not to drive while he ate, just to be relaxed. Sit down to eat your Big Mac. Yeah, sit down to eat while you're, you're <laughs> eating your food, right? So a month goes by, sees the guy again. He's lost 10 pounds, and he quit eating at McDonald's. After he said he wouldn't. Yeah. And why? Because when he forced himself to sit down, do the breathing technique, so it took a couple minutes. It only takes two minutes. He was relaxed, right? And once he relaxed and sat down and paid attention to what he was eating, he realized he didn't even like it. It Hmm. tasted horrible to him. He never paid that much attention to it when he was driving. It was something he shoved in his face, basically. And so once he sat down and realized that, and he started relaxing around his food. He not only quit eating the junk food and started eating better food, but he had more energy and he lost 10 pounds. Yeah, you know, that doesn't surprise me because in teaching yoga, I often have new students who, when they're introduced to pranayama, breathing exercises, they feel a tremendous difference in just doing three to six minutes a day of breathing exercise pranayama. This is why you have to do something uh to bring yourself back to full conscious presence when you sit down to eat. Now, a lot of people pray before the, and that's perfectly fine. That'll do it. You know, besides if, whether you believe in prayer or not, it's a signal that you're stopping your normal day and you're engaging in something else. And having gratitude. And having gratitude. And once you sit down and do that, your nervous system completely switches. Mm -hmm. You start to switch to parasympathetic and your body utilizes your food differently. Mm. And if you're not doing something conscious like that throughout the day, then you're not going to be actually uh, absor- you know, digesting and absorbing your food the same way. Yeah, that's really interesting. So if you look at all these things, you can, and we have, we, we're just kind of scratching the surface of oh, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. You look at just heart disease and high blood pressure and then how diabetes rolls up into that because, you know, everybody with... You know, the highest rates of heart disease are with people with diabetes. And then you look at how digestive issues play into all these things. Right. You know, this is where this whole thing comes about. Stress just disrupts basic function. Well, we've talked about the good part of stress, which is that in some ways it does engage your body, right? It can make us healthier when you have minor stresses on the body, such as building your muscle tissue or having a response that you might need in a life-threatening situation. We've talked about the bad part of stress, which is basically that it contributes to illness, right? Um, Such as heart disease, high blood pressure, digestion, diabetes, lack of immunity. What's the ugly part of stress? Well, the ugly part of stress is that it it ages you rapidly (laughs) and wears you out. Because all these things have to do with, you know, with the... The breakdown of your body. It has to do with not having optimum level of functioning in your body and how your cells are literally being deprived of nourishment and sure. energy your whole life. And so that's basically the ugly part of it. So, Roger, you have talked about the physical effects of the stress response on the heart, the blood vessels hormones. What is the physical effects of the stress response on the brain? Well, the brain has a wide range of, let's say, inflammation that occurs during stress. So just the fact that you have a presence of a high level of cortisol Mm -hmm. causes the memory center of your brain, which is called the hippocampus, to actually become inflamed and damaged. And what is cortisol again? Cortisol is the stress hormone. So when you have elevated levels of stress hormone, the hippocampus area of your brain becomes more inflamed Mm -hmm. and susceptible to other toxins in your brain. And this is important, too, because when you're under chronic stress and you have um, you know, just been locked into that chronic stress for a long time, it weakens the blood-brain barrier, so your brain is actually exposed to more toxins. And now the hippocampus, the center that they all call the memory center, um, soaks up more of those toxins. And especially like if you've had a traumatic experience, say you had a head injury, mm-hmm. well, for a few weeks after a head injury, then your brain barrier really becomes weak and lets more things up into your brain that cause inflammation and cause long-term damage. What is the blood-brain barrier? Child? Well, it's a barrier that keeps certain levels of uh, toxins out of your brain. 
It's a different filter-like system. Like a membrane? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that, but it's just a barrier that does not let certain things up into your brain. It protects it. And so this is why with certain chemotherapies and different drug protocols, they have a problem with dealing with brain issues because it's hard to get past the blood-brain barrier. Mm. It just has a different level of protection for your brain. And so this is why with certain nutrients, certain drugs, uh, different things, they all do testing to see how it, uh, you know, how it works with the blood-brain barrier. So when you're under stress, though, the thing to remember is that the inflammatory chemicals um, tend to organize themselves, so to speak, in the hippocampus area of the brain. Hmm. So it damages that part of your brain. And if you've had a trauma, like a physical trauma, that makes the blood-brain barrier weaker. And so more toxins can make it up into your brain. So it's really just a, another reason why you want to eat well. You don't want to have toxins in your food. Mm. You want to have a clean diet. You want to do all these things because you never know when, you know, you're going to have a head trauma. You never, you never know. know when you're going to have a head trauma. <laughs> well, you know, it happens to three million people a I, year. I know. I mean, it's nothing to laugh at, but it's just kind of funny the way you say, I mean, Well, yeah. you, could have, you could have a slight auto accident. You could... You could fall over on your bicycle. People skate. All these different things. Or people things. walking in the winter, right? Or you can walking, slip on yeah. ice. All these different things cause trauma. And that type of a trauma weakens your blood-brain barrier for two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. So then the toxins in your food, whether it's pesticides, heavy metals, or you know, just even your body producing antibodies to something you ate that you're allergic to. It Mm -hmm. all makes it up into your brain Mm -hmm. and can cause an inflammatory response. Hmm. So again, it's just another reason why you pay attention to your diet, you pay attention to stress, you pay attention to all these things because it's just being proactive for your health. And there's nothing that you can be more proactive for than brain health because, you know, that's the the main thing you want to protect as you age. Now, you yourself have had numerous head injuries from athletics and accidents and bad luck over the years. Um, Did you formulate your adaptogenic herb formulas for personal use at some point? Well, everything I formulate is for personal <laughs> use, but but I didn't do it specifically just for my brain injuries. Although, you know, the nutrition I use, the Chinese herbs, all these things really help me with my own brain injury. And they're part of my uh, healing path to figuring out, you know, how to deal with brain injury and all those different aspects of health. So I, you know, it has been part of my healing process. Yeah. And, and everything yeah. that I've learned and everything that I apply to Tian Chi and the inner mm-hmm. peace all really has to do with, you know, past experience. Yeah, you've actually had such severe head injuries that you've lost the ability to speak, lost memory. You, you've really had some real, some fear, severe traumas. Yeah, but again, I honestly believe the brain can recover from anything, given the right set of circumstances, the right nutrition, the right energetics, you know, with herbs. Mm. All these different things. You can create something, you know, sort of a prophylactic type program to protect your brain from just about anything. Because I don't see why uh, the brain should be any different than any part of your, any other part of your body. Why shouldn't your brain be able to go back to a set point of equilibrium and heal itself, given the right tools? Oh, that's a wonderful philosophy. This is Laura Shakti. And Roger Drummer. Thanks for listening to the HerbWorks podcast. And if you want more information, go to HerbWorks.com. HerbWorks.com.